So welcome. My name is, uh, sorry, I'm a little short. My name is uh, Alex piotrowski Daspit, uh, and I have the pleasure of co-chairing this session with uh, Patrickson. Uh, and so you're here today for Symposium 11, uh, Nucleotide Delivery to CF Lungs, Emerging Strategies and Barriers to Success. So essentially, it's going to be all about delivery, right? So different kinds of delivery vehicles, as well as barriers to delivery, and then potential strategies to, to overcome them. And I think we can all uh, arguably agree that um, uh, delivery is the linchpin to the success of many uh, nucleic acid-based therapies. So hopefully, um, we'll learn a lot today. Um, and we've got uh, four speakers lined up. Uh, each of the speakers will give a 20-minute talk, followed by five minutes of Q&A. And then following all of the sessions, uh, we also have some built-in time for um, a panel-style Q&A session with all of the speakers at the end for about 15 minutes. So um, we really wanted to keep the intro short and sweet. So I think we'll just go ahead and kick it off. So Jay Coles from Tulane, would you mind? Thank you. Blue to the matrix. <laughs> so thank you. Okay. All right. Um, thanks, everybody. I'm J uh, Jake Holes from Tulane, and the organizers had asked me to talk about immunological considerations in the, in particularly in the, in the pulmonary space, um, um, relevant to CF and CF. I'll, I hope at the end of this talk you'll appreciate how unique the immunological uh, spaces and, and CF compared to other lung diseases. So should I use this or to advance or, or? Oh, and also the other thing is I probably need a laser pointer. Yeah. Yeah, set that. Yep. Perfect. I think the keyboard tends to work better, so I'd suggest Okay, that. cool. All right, no, uh, I have no disclosures. So um, actually my first grant ever was a gene transfer grant from the uh, from the Cystic Fibrosis uh, Foundation. And this is a study we did in rhesus macaques at the Tulane Primate Center with an adenovirus like C um, vector. And you can see that we got pretty decent uh, delivery here, but a lot of off-target delivery here, all the way down in the type 2 uh, pneumocytes, uh, and then uh, very Im inflammatory responses to the ad vector. Um, and so, you know, this kind of spurred me on to say, well, we better understand the lung immune system better if we're going to be be successful at this. So, um, and then the other interesting thing about it, uh, CF is so there's been GWAS studies in asthma, CF, COPD, and the, uh, interestingly, the genes in COPD are typically development genes, so genes that control lung development. In contrast, the, the GWAS data in CF strongly implicates uh, genes in the adaptive immune system, and we wrote a review for that for Journal of Immunology just two years ago. But you know, one of the uh, genes that's um, is associated with the worst lung function, at least in the gene modifier study, which was homozygous f Dell individuals are, are uh, class two genes, which associate with uh, both lung function, but also uh, age at first to pseudomonas acquisition. And so class two is a molecule that's on antigen presenting cells, um, and uh, it drives CD4 T cell responses, uh, as well as uh, antibody responses. And importantly, another interesting thing about the lung um, is that in certain situations, uh, the, uh, we think lung dendritic cells are the major antigen-presenting cell, but also B cells in the lung have been shown to be really functional antigen-presenting cells, and this may have to do with the size of the particle. So a uh, fungal spore like pneumocystis um, is, is B cell dependent. Um, and this has also been shown for in the periphery with viral-like particles above 100 nanometers. Um, and so the way B cells present antigen is typically they recognize it th through the B cell receptor, uh, which can be encoded by IgM or, or IgG. Um, and this may explain why patients on rituximab, for example, get opportunistic infections, T-cell-dependent infections like pneumocystis, because uh, they don't prime T-cells normally. Um, so several years ago, Jeff Curl and I uh, started doing RNA sequencing in the in bronchial brushes from pediatric patients undergoing uh, clinical bronchoscopy for CF exacerbation. Um, and uh, what we found was a pretty unique uh, transcriptional profile with strong evidence of Th1 immunity, Th17 immunity, but also a lot of B cells in the mucosa of the epithelium. So um, you see uh, all these are all molecules on the surface of uh, B cells, CD22 and CD79, uh, but also brutin, styrosine kinase. And you see a lot of class-switched 
um, immunoglobulin uh, genes. And we went on to sequence some of these. Um, so about 7% of these B cells are pseudomonas specific. And what's really interesting is that these in this cohort, they had very little somatic hypermutation. So the patients were making antibodies, but they were essentially germline encoded. So antibodies are different from T cell receptors. So B cell receptors, once they encounter antigen, they can class switch from an IgM to an IgG uh, class of antibody, but they also undergo somatic hypermutation. So the antibody affinity to the target uh, improves uh, upon somatic hypermutation. So suggesting that these antibodies were um, not, not that functional. Um, and then on the T cell side, class two can regulate uh, these effector cells, um, and we typically divide them into three subsets. Um, TH2, TH1, and TH17, and there's a deliberate, um, um, basically, uh, uh, these cells have different functions. So TH2 cells are part of pr providing helper function to B cells. For example, IL-4 is actually essential for B cells to switch to IgE, for example, and that's why we target IL-4 in diseases with like atopic dermatitis and allergy, um, but they're also critical for expelling helminth infection from the GI tract. TH1 cells we know are really critical for intracellular pathogens um, and, uh, and for uh, pathogens like t uh, both listeria and, and TB that grow in the phagolysosome of macrophages. And then TH17 cells are really critical for extracellular pathogens uh, uh, and also uh, fungi. So we wanted to know um, in these uh, CF brushes, well, you know, what's the dominant uh, TH1, TH2, or TH17 profile. And to, to do this, um, so we treated HBE cells with interferon IL-13 or IL-17 and generated gene signatures, and then we used those genes to, to basically mine what's going on in CF. And you can see that during, at least in pediatric exacerbation, there's a very strong uh, TH1 um, activation in the airway. Um, and then this is control, these are non-CF controls, this is mild asthma. Uh, moderate to severe asthma that we got. These are samples from Sally Wenzel's um, uh, um, severe asthma program. And uh, severe asthma, also there's a subset of patients that also have a strong TH1 signature. Interestingly, we didn't see much evidence of TH2 signature. So here's, uh, for example, here's periostin. This was a biomarker that Genentech developed to try to uh, stratify what patients potentially would respond to NDAL13. And it, it's not, um, it's upregulated in asthma, but not upregulated in, in CF, at least in this cohort. And then there's evidence of a strong TH17 signature. So what's unique about CF that you, that you don't see with asthma um, is, again, uh, despite the, these are the footprints, right? right? So these are, the, these are the signatures of the T cells, if it's sitting in the submucosa, signaling to the epithelium. Um, but in contrast to asthma, what you see in CF is actually evidence of intraepithelial lymphocytes. And you, you typically don't see intraepithelial lymphocytes unless in the GI tract. So there, you, you see these when there's an, a huge microbiome. Um, and then the other interesting consideration of CF is that particularly untreated patients uh, have um, what's called inducible bronchial-associated lymphoid tissues. So these are, um, this is a paper recently by uh, Federica Pavaroni. Um, at, uh, I, th I think she did this work when she was in Boston. And uh, eyeballed are these tertiary lymphoid structures that um, can actually process an antigen and uh, present... Um, uh, uh, antigen without the antigen having to drain all the way back to the mediastinal lymph node. So these sit in the submucosal space, and they have a B cell area, T cell area, and they can form germinal center reactions and, and present antigen in situ um, in the airway. It's a, um, very similar to the pyrus patch of the GI tract. So I, I mentioned um, th uh, this, these two papers. So th uh, this is uh, the B cells is ABC. So this is the VLP particle that was published in Immunity, showing that the size of the nanoparticle, particularly above 100 nanometers, B cells become a more dominant um, player. And then this is a paper we did that showed that anti-CD20 um, depleting B cells um, can make uh, mice susceptible to pneumocystis pneumonia. And due to the fact that they don't prime, uh, there's no T CD4 T cell priming when you deplete the B cells. So we had a hypothesis that, that viral vectors would induce uh, two classes of, of cells. So, um, so we thought these T cells typically were effector cells that would form memory and, and go back to the lymph node. And when you encountered pathogen again, they would emigrate from the lymph node into the parenchyma and effector function. But we now know there's a population of cells that reside in the tissue itself. And these are called tissue resident memory cells, or if they're, so if they're T cells or TRM cells, and if they're 
uh, B cells or BRM cells. Um, and you can you see them after you know, viral infection or after um, antigen encounter. And so we wanted to know, uh, since anti-CD20 blocks the T-cell response, maybe that would be a useful strategy to block both antibody response as well as T-cell response. So this is work done by Robert Clark, and he's actually going to talk in more depth um, uh, tomorrow. But uh, Robert uh, looked at uh, vehicle control or two doses of anti-CD20, either 100 uh, micrograms or 200 micrograms. Uh, and we used adenovirus five vectors because of the we figured if we could block the immune response to ad five, which is a highly immunogenic vector, then potentially vectors such as AAV may be even um, easier to do. And so, um, so he followed these animals out to day thirty one. And what you can see is that um, NSCD twenty was pretty effective at blocking serum IgG, um, but completely blocked luminal IgA and IgG, um, and also blocked the, the, um, the generation of these uh, BRM cells. This allowed essentially redosing at 100% efficiency. So what we did here was prime with an ad5 EGFP vector, and then came back with ad -like C, and you can see transduction of the airway here, like C. But essentially, um, this is the 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 isotype control is the group is the group that got a isotype antibody, and then but got previously dosed with vector, and this is a, a naive, and you can see that the anti CD20 um, really restores remarkably. Um, that. So what, what is the relative role of, of antibody in this, and, and, um, and is there any role for serum antibody? And to look at that, uh, we used a couple of genetic uh, models, and let me just walk you through because it's a little bit, a lot of data on the slide, but um, basically what we did was we used IgA knockouts, FCRN knockouts, so that's the neonatal FC receptor. Um, this is actually how IgG gets across the placenta, but it's also how IgG gets into the lung. So if anybody treated somebody with a COVID monoclonal antibody, this is how a COVID monoclonal antibody gets into the lung. It gets into, and what's interesting is these neonatal FC receptors are largely in the alveolar space. So by single cell sequencing, they're in the type one, type two cells. So they don't, uh, this is why, you know, anybody who's treated patients with IVIG for common variable hypogammal albuminemia, they still get bronchitis, they can get sinus infection, but they don't get pneumonia, all right? Um, so, these, uh, so these mice had compromised redosing. However, if you take a mouse that can't make IgM or class switch IgG, so this is a AID, uh, that's cytosine deaminase that mediates class switch recombination, and then this is a, a deletion in I, uh, secreted IgM, these mice, you can redose perfectly fine, suggesting that luminal antibody, it will be the right limiting step. Um, then we also did single cell TCR sequencing in this model. What you can see is that compared to spleen, which are very polyclonal, you get this uh, population of T cells that are uh, elicited in the lung. And that these T cells are, are um, TRM cells because what we do is before we sacrifice the animal, we inject anti CD45 intravenously. That labels any contaminating blood cells, and the, the T cells that are in the tissue are excluded and not stained. And what's really interesting is that if you look at the TCR repertoire, in the parenchyma versus the BAL, um, they're highly correlated with each other, uh, suggesting that these TRM cells recirculate between the parenchyma and the um, um, in, in, in the BAL compartment. So um, potentially you know, using BAL could could determine whether um, your gene therapy uh, vector is eliciting this response or not. Um, lastly, I'm just going to show some data on IL-21. So. Um, IL-21 and IL-21 receptor are, are interesting targets because IL-21 is both on B cells and T, T uh, or T receptors both on B cells and T cells, and it's really critical for T, what are called T follicular helper cells. These are the cells that are in the germinal center, CD4 cells, that actually allow B cells to class switch. Um, and so we uh, looked at IL-21 receptor knockout mice, and um, these mice also have quite defective antibody responses um, to, um, to uh, add vectors. Um, they also, interestingly, have a reduced number of CD8 cells elicited after vector administration um, uh, in the lung. And it, again, when we did uh, the IL-21 receptor knockout, we could also get much more efficient gene transfer on a secondary gene transfer experiment. So when the pro uh, Pfizer had developed an anti-IL-21 receptor antibody for autoimmune disease, and we're in the process of, of testing that as a potential another strategy to allow uh, redosing of, of viral vectors, both in the context of um, um, adenovirus, but also AAV. So um, <clears throat> we're in the process of looking at this pathway with AAV 6.2. 
uh, vectors. And we're also um, trying to model eyeballs. So um, there's several tools you can do to induce eyeballs in mice and see if, if the eyeball structures themselves sh basically shift the immune response to the left. So more rapid, maybe uh, even greater antibody or greater TRM response. Um, and because um, uh, I think that would be an important thing to, to know. So um, I want to acknowledge the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation for a Path to a Cure uh, grant. Um, we, some of the T cells uh, assays that we run, we use tetramers, which we get from the tetramer core. And then Robert Clark and, um, is an MD PhD student in the lab doing the adenovirus work. And Amina Hanna is actually an R38 uh, scholar, NHLBI R38 scholar um, in the lab that's doing the work on uh, IL-21 receptor. Um, and I'll be happy to answer any questions, sir. All right, so we have quite a bit of time for questions. Um, and also, uh, you can enter questions into the app, and we can uh, ask them out here. Uh, and there's a microphone here in the center. Clear as mud. <laughs> I'll try one. Thanks for the talk. Um, sure. Jonathan Raymond from Vancouver. Do you think that there is any role given what you've seen for co-administration of some sort of immunomodulatory medication with, um, say, a, a, an NAV uh, a vector um, to, you know, bl blunt the immune, uh, immune response? Well, yeah. I mean, I th that's essentially why we're conducting the studies we're doing is to try to really understand, like, what would be the best you know, if we're going to co-administer an immunomodulatory uh, strategy. And so, you know, we're focused on drugs that are already FDA approved. Um, one reason, another reason why we chose rituximab is when I was at Pittsburgh, we would use it uh, not uncommonly in our CF patients after lung transplant, right, who develop um, post-transplant liver proliferative disease, and it's fairly well tolerated. So, um, so um, you know, yeah, so, you know, anti-CD20, I think, you know, it, it would be a drug repurposing thing. If we target IL-21 receptor, it, it, it has been through phase one safety studies in healthy volunteers, but I don't think there's a lot of, you know, particularly CF-specific use of that drug, so. Sure, and, and would it be repeated or once or, yeah, lots of, lots of questions. Yeah, I, well, I think that's really going to depend, also, yeah, on the efficiency, um, um, you know, like how much redosing would need to be. And I, th I think we're early enough in the in the in the clinical trials that, that to my mind, is a little bit unclear. Thank you. Yep. Hey, Paul. Hi, Paul McCray from University of Iowa. I wore this tie for you. Oh, thanks. Okay. <laughs> so, um, the uh, readministration of AAV vectors has been something of concern in the hemophilia trials, for example. What What are your thoughts on if if a subject receives a single dose of AAV? what will happen with their mucosal antibodies that prevent readministration in a time-dependent fashion. Yeah. So is, there, is there a window where it wanes, or you know, is there any knowledge there that you can impart? Well, I, I think, so, so clearly in the systemic hemophilia trials, there, there are antibodies, and interestingly, they don't seem to be, rituximab is not as useful in the preclinical models with systemic um, gene delivery. So it seems to be more effective, perhaps in in pulmonary. Um, and again, I think I think in the systemic circulation, particularly targeting the liver, you're going to have other antigen presenting cells like Kupfer cells or or other macrophages, and where B cells probably aren't huge APCs and like they are in the lung. Um, once you have transduction, though, and expression of your transgene, you know, even if you elicit some antibodies, I, I mean, I guess there's a possibility that like complement mediated. Uh, deposition or NK cell activation that would um, that you know that those those antibodies could activate, but um, in you know but you know even in, in a disease where you have lots of autoantibodies like systemic lupus for example lupus nephritis um, you know the, uh, I don't know whether those antibodies would mediate a similar kind of pathology in, in the CF lung. But I think monitoring the isotype of antibody will be really important, whether it's complement fixing. And then also, you know, in, in lupus, it's the, the focosylation of the heavy chain is what drives a lot of the NK cell activation. So, um, so there's a lot, you know, a lot of potential where antibodies could cause damage. Thanks. 
Uh, I have a question too. Um, so I know a lot of your experience has been sort of with viral vectors, but I wonder if you have any insight or uh, perhaps speculation as to how um, uh, this might apply to non-viral vehicles. Well, th there I think I think that you mostly kind of be concerned about you know CFTR responses into a CFTR null individual, um, and you know it's a little bit unclear how uh, well CFTR would be actually be you know, what, what peptides could be loaded onto a, you know, class one MHC. I think we need to understand that better um, and, and how efficiently that would be. Um, I did talk to Mark Anderson at, uh, he's the guy that cloned AIR, right? So AIR is the gene that uh, is in your thymic epithelium and it presents self antigen to um, T cells. And so the ultraactive T cells get deleted in the thymus and patients with AIR mutations, you know, get type one diabetes, right? They get, they get auto endocrine um, T cell and antibody responses. And interestingly, they don't look anything, they don't, I'm not aware of an air mutation having anything, a phenotype that looks remotely like CF. And, and Mark doesn't have any data that CFTR is presented, you know, in an air dependent fashion to T cells. But, um, so I don't know. So the immunogenicity of C, you know, expressing, you know, CFTR in a null individual, I think it still would need, needs to be determined. Wonderful. Let's thank our speaker one more time. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so next up we've got Patrick Sin from the University of Iowa, and the title of his talk is Viral Vector Delivery to the Airways. All right. Yeah, so I'd like to start off by thanking the, uh, the foundation for giving me the opportunity to chair today. And I'd like to thank myself for the opportunity to talk today. <laughs> um, so I'll be, let's see, I have nothing to disclose. So just to orient everybody, I'll be talking about gene therapy for cystic fibrosis and I'm, I'm really focused on uh, viral vectors specifically. And I, when I think of gene therapy, I do think of two subgroups, and that's either gene addition, where we want to deliver the CFTR gene, or uh, gene editing, where you want to deliver like CRISPR or AVEs or, or um, prime editing. But either way, uh, it comes down to efficiency. You need it to deliver efficiently to a lot of cell types um, across the very large surface area of the lung. And so there's a lot of different cell types. You know, you're going to hear a lot about that at the meeting, obviously, if you don't already know about it. There's a lot of cell types in the airways, and these are um, just this kind of a, a short list of some of them. Um, but let's see, how do I get them? Where is it here? Yeah, I got it. Great. Um, so. It used to be we, we, we talked about ciliated cells being important for, for correction for cystic fibrosis, but now I think it's more widely accepted that secretory cells are probably one of the main movers of chloride, ion, chloride ions into the, uh, into the lumen. And of course, there's also ionocytes that um, are rare but produce a lot of CFTR. But we also think about basal cells in my lab. Um, of course, basal cells are uh, a progenitor cell population that may be necessary to cure, uh, may be necessary to transduce this uh, cell type for a single viral vector treatment or at least as few viral vector treatments as possible. So for both for secretory cells and basal cells, uh, it may be necessary to open up tight junctions. Um, for a lot of viral vectors, the receptors are on the basal lateral surface of columnar epithelia. And to get access to basal cells, uh, it may be necessary to open up tight junctions. So we have uh, screened, uh, over the years, we've screened quite a few different reagents that can, are known to uh, impact transepithelial resistance. Uh, and transepithelial resistance is an indirect measure <clears throat> of, of tight junction integrity. And so in this experiment, we, we took primary cultures of human airway epithelial cells grown on an air liquid interface and you can put media on top, and you can measure the, 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 the resistance from, from top to bottom, which is the, the uh, transepithelial um, trans electrical resistance. 
And if you put media on top, you get a baseline of about 750 ohms. And uh, PBS++ plus plus is plus magnesium and calcium, has a, has a minor effect on TER. PBS minus minus, so without magnesium and calcium, kind of drops it down a little bit further. And EGTA drops it down even further. And EGTA has been, is a calcium chelator that's been used for 25 years or more to <clears throat> open up tight junctions and allow basolateral access of different viral vectors. And then more recently in our lab, we've been using LPC, the lysophosphatylcholine. And this is a lot of work that's um, come out of David Parsons lab where if you treat cells with 0.1% LPC, you can dramatically uh, and transiently uh, open up tight junctions to allow basolateral access. And as you see, uh, with, with decreasing TER, you can see increasing levels of, of gene transfer in these primary cultures. And this is, this is an ad uh, GFP. Um, And so that we studied, we published a study a few years ago where we delivered uh, ad GFP with LPC to the airways of newborn pigs. And we looked, uh, it was pretty labor intensive. We, we took sections all the way down from the large airways down to the small airways. And so this is a large airway of about a, a one millimeter, squ micro millimeter square down to 50 microns squared. And we saw a pretty uniform, nice gene transfer all the way down uh, 30 to nearly 50 percent um, GFP positive cells. And if you look at, uh, so this is a, a pig lung where we dissected away all the parenchyma. You can see really nice GFP expression in all lobes uh, from the large to the small airways. Um, and it looks brighter simply because it's thinner tissue and the, the photons can penetrate a little bit easier. But it was pretty uniform all the way down. And if you look at cell types, uh, we saw basal cells, ciliated cells, non-ciliated cells. And interestingly, we also saw submucosal glands, which I still don't really understand the mechanism. If you, we didn't really see a whole lot in the interstitium, but we did see uh, some submucosal glands that were just highly lit up, uh, which suggested to me that somehow the vector was getting down uh, the, the, um, uh, the ducts to the submucosal glands somehow upstream against the mucus, although we, we still don't really understand the mechanism of that. Um, so speaking of mucus, we've done a more recent experiment where we take tracheal explants from, from pigs, and you can put them on these uh, surgifoam support, support sponges. And uh, so that keeps them wet with media on the, on the bottom, and they stay dry on top except for whatever the explants themselves are secreting. Uh, and you can keep them naive, or you can treat them with methacholine, and methacholine is an agonist that forces all of the mucus in those submucosal glands and goblet cells to just come out all at once. And so you get a massive flow of mucus um, uh, within five minutes on, on these explants. And we can stain for MUC5B or MUC5AC, uh, which uh, looks at the mucus from either the submucosal glands or the goblet cells. And so if you do a naive culture, you can, you can detect it. But in a methacholine-treated uh, explant, you get these waves of uh, a lot of mucus that the cilia immediately start to roll up into ropes and kind of squeegee off over to the, uh, to the edge of the explant. And all this happens fairly rapidly. But it's, um, it's a pretty rapid model of uh, mucus hypersecretion in, in, this, model, in, uh, in this culture. But what you have to remember is methacholine stimulates mucus secretion for this next slide. And so we took explants, either minus methacholine or plus methacholine, and we delivered adenovirus expressing M. cherry, either with or without LPC. And uh, so this is a stereoscopic uh, image where without LPC, you don't see much, and with LPC, you see a lot. And uh, so to quantify, we, um, so these, uh, we, these are all sustained with DAPI, and so we would take 10, 10 pictures focusing on the DAPI channel, um, and then once they were exported into, into the image J, we could look at to see what we see with the, uh, in the M cherry channel, in the red channel. So it was a way to, to blindly take 10 images per, per explant. And so, uh, so we basically just quantified red pixels per, per high-powered field. 
And you can see that without methacholine, in the presence of LPC, we saw a huge increase in the amount of gene transfer with, with Adam Cherry. And in the, in the presence of methacholine, we still see a nice in, in, increase in the amount of gene transfer in the presence of, L, of LPC. And if you note the, uh, in, uh, the minus and the plus conditions and the minus LPC conditions, they look about the same. Uh, the only real difference is in the plus LPC, we don't really get to the same extent as we do in the, in the minus methacholine. That's about the only difference. It's still an improvement, but we don't get quite the improvement. So there may be an effect of mucus, but it, it, I wouldn't, it's not, at least in, in this model system, I, it's, I wouldn't call it an impenetrable barrier to, to adenoviral gene transfer. So one question, when I present these data, there's a question I very routinely get, both uh, in oral presentations or grant applications or, <laughs> or papers, and that's, is opening tight junctions dangerous? Uh, if you open up tight junctions uh, with LPC, is there a risk uh, of uh, systemic infections from all the bacteria that's in a, in a CF person's lungs? So to test that, uh, so this is the, the same data I showed you for early on. We had an additional condition, and that was 3.6% uh, sodium chloride. And it, as you may know, people with CF routinely uh, go through hypertonic saline treatments. Uh, they're, they're approved up to over 7%. Uh, to do multiple times a day, multiple times a week. So it's a very common treatment uh, in, in people with CF. And we found that with 3.6% sodium chloride actually dropped TER to the same level as LPC. And when we did our experiment with, with uh, ADGFP, we saw remarkably good gene transfer efficiency just by making the vehicle more uh, hypertonic. So now my talk's gonna take a left turn and I'm only gonna be talking about sodium chloride from here on out. Uh, so hopefully you can see, but um, so this is just sodium chloride with DMEM and 1% or 1% uh, sodium chloride. We see a little bit of a boost in gene transfer. So it's just barely above isotonic. And we found that it was dose responsive all the way up to 7%. Uh, and, it was, and this is, you know, this is, some of the best gene transfer we've ever seen from an ap apical application of adenovirus. And I will say that at six to 7%, we did see some increased LDH activity, which suggests cytotoxicity. So for most of our in vitro experiments, we, we try to keep it less than 5%. And it also worked with potassium chloride, although it was kind of shifted to the right, which kind of lines up with, with, with its molarity. But it didn't work with mannitol. Um, so it seems like it's, it's some phenomenon that's, that's uh, 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 an ionic uh, osmolite, but not a non-ionic osmolite is driving this effect. So it's not just simply shrinking the cells and, and letting the vector in. There seems to be more to it than that. So we looked at different cell types transduced in the primary cultures. Um, so we looked at basal cells, uh, and there was a dose response of increased gene transfer in the basal cells. Uh, this is all done by flow. We also saw uh, increase in ciliated cells and secretory cells. So there doesn't seem to be a, um, a cell-specific effect of this increase. It seems to be broadly applicable to the cell types within the primary cultures. And next we did a correction study in, um, so using primary cultures from CF donors, uh, this is an oocine chamber, um, I've seen this explained three times today, so hopefully I don't have to explain it again. But um, basically, the force gland IBMX turns on the channel, and the GLI-H turns off the channel. That's oversimplified, but that's, that's an easy way to think about it. Uh, and so this is a CF culture and where there's no response to FNI or GLI-H. Uh, add CFTR, apically applied, doesn't have much of an effect. But add CFTR plus 3.6% sodium chloride had a huge... Uh, response in the, in the, in the short-circuit current. Uh, and a wild-type uh, uh, culture uh, was somewhere intermediate. And we could, uh, in replicates, and, and on average, the uh, 3.6 sodium chloride uh, was about the same as, as non-CF cultures. And full disclosure, this, this curve kind of came from this guy, so I am, I am definitely showing you the best one. 
Uh, so is it receptor dependent? Uh, that was our next question. So this the same data I've already shown you without sodium chloride, not, and not much with sodium chloride it looks really good. And so we knocked out the receptor for adenovirus is CAR. It's also, its actual gene name is CXADR. And so we knocked out uh, CAR in these cultures and found that we no longer could uh, uh, achieve gene transfer, suggesting that it is CAR dependent. And as a control, we used AD21 instead of AD5, which AD21 uses CD46 as a receptor. And so it, it still got in just fine. Uh, and so these data are um, shown here where this is AD5 with, without and with, and these are the knockout cells. So these are AD5 and this is AD21. Uh, what about other viral vectors? So um, here's the lentiviral vector. We deliver GP64 pseudotyped HIV expressing GFP to non-CF cells. And then again, saw a dose response in gene transfer efficiency up to 10%. Um, and th these are non-CF cells, these are CF cells. So again, 4.5%, uh, uh, we see over 10% you know, based on uh, flow data. And I'd just like to stop and say that this is by far the most gene transfer we've seen with a reporter gene using a lentiviral vector in this culture model system. It's, uh, we're already taking it for granted, as, um, but uh, it, this, this blows my socks off every time I see it. Uh, looking at the, the currents, so it's the same color scheme as before. Uh, the light blue is, is, with, uh, is the lentiviral with um, sodium chloride, and the dark blue is the wild type. So we see a nice CFTR, CFTR dependent current. And this, these are the uh, averages. So it's, uh, uh, it's approaching wild type. And interestingly, we saw that it, it doesn't work with every envelope that we've tested. So it works with GP64 and it works with VSVG, but it didn't work with JSRV or this uh, baboon uh, endogenous virus. And the, the reason we chose these is because we know what the receptors are and we know where they're localized. And these are both apical localized receptors. And these are both uh, envelopes from retroviruses. So that we don't really yet know the, the mechanism why it would work for some envelopes but not others. Something we're definitely interested in and we're following up on, but uh, you know, screening more viruses to see what it works on and what it doesn't work on might give us clues to what the mechanism might be. It also enhances AAV transduction. So here we used AAV uh, 2.5T expressing GFP with this is virus alone, and this is uh, with 4.5% sodium chloride. Uh, and these are the uh, percentages based on flow. And here again are the, the chloride currents. Um, I don't have a wild type on this one, but this is the uh, AAV 2.5T plus 4.5% sodium chloride looks really nice. And this is without it. So we still get a, an, you actually get a pretty good response without sodium chloride with AAV, but with sodium chloride it looks even better. So does it work in vivo? Here's a mouse experiment we did with ad luciferase, uh, where we delivered it via tracheal intubation um, with either saline or with 7% sodium chloride, <clears throat> and saw that uh, in, indeed there was a boost in uh, lung expression based on IVUS. So what about a pig? Uh, so going back to explant data, so this is delivering ad M cherry with 5% sodium chloride to a pig explant. Uh, we saw remarkably good uh, gene transfer efficiency. Uh, without sodium chloride, you, there is expression there, but you have to kind of zoom in further and it's kind of spotty. Uh, so it's, it's quantified over here. Uh, AAV, we use uh, AAV H22 as, as our, is the pig tropic capsid. So we see a nice uh, gene transfer in the presence of 5% sodium chloride in the explants as well. So uh, what about in vivo? So we delivered ad GFP to pig airways um, using our standard protocol, comparing saline to 5% sodium chloride. And uh, so this is right at dissection. We, we look at the lungs under the dissecting scope, pretty low power. And uh, so this was the best lobe we could find with the PBS. Um, uh, most of the other lobes were just black. Uh, but with 5% sodium chloride, we saw very widespread 
uh, expression lighting up the entire lung. And this is a section through the through the lobe. You can just see widespread uh, expression from um, from all the way across. And if you zoom in, we see expression in both the conducting airways uh, as well as the alveoli. So that, that's uh, so. Just to conclude, um, this is where we started. So this is what you get when you just apically apply viral vectors without any particular vehicle. You uh, usually don't see anything. <laughs> um, and that was, that was something I was used to for quite a while. But this is where we're at. So uh, now we're, um, we're just getting remarkable levels of lentiviral ad and AAV transduction. And I should point out that we, may, um, that we first made this observation about 11 months ago with the sodium chloride. So uh, um, we've been, and this is the first time we've actually publicly talked about it, but it, it, it's, it's, it's really transformed um, a lot of the things that we can do in this model system and ask some, some brand new questions. A couple of things I just want you to, to remember is that transiently opening tight junctions using sodium chloride enhances gene transfer. Uh, it's very simple and it works really well and very reproducibly. And um, importantly, opening tight junctions is unlikely to cause systemic bacterial infections in CF patients. So uh, I think that's the, that's the original reason we started, why we did that experiment to test that, and it, and it led to a, a whole new uh, delivery strategy for, for viral vector. Um, so I'll just end with, uh, I'll end with a personal anecdote about every person on this slide. <laughs> uh, now, I, I, I'd like to, I would like to acknowledge everybody on the sixth floor of PBDB. Um, it's a, it's a, at the University of Iowa, it's a, it's a very highly collaborative environment. Um, uh, it's, it's a very rich environment to do research. And I'd like, also like to thank Paul McRae, who has been heavily involved in the studies I've been talking about today, and someone whom I've, I've, I've collaborated with uh, for a very long time now. And uh, he's, he's speaking in the, the plenary section next. Uh, this is uh, the people in the viral vector core who we keep very busy. We're, um, we, we were probably one of the heaviest users in, in, in this core. And this is my lab. And uh, I'd like to specifically point out Ashley Cooney, who, uh, who made the original observation uh, 11 months ago and has taken this project by the horns and really uh, driven it to where we are uh, now. So with that, I would be happy to take any questions. This is great work, Pat, and, and congratulations, Ashley. Also, this is really beautiful. I'm Katie Scotham from SpireVamp, work with you guys in, for many, many years. I'm just wondering, in your animal experiments, did you look at all to see if there was any differences in the immune response to the vector or any additional tox toxicity? You've done a lot of vectors, so I don't know if you can share any of that. Well, yeah, everything we've done to date is pretty short term, so we haven't looked at any sort of we definitely haven't done any persistent studies, and we haven't really looked for any markers for for immune response but per se. I, I would, with the ad especially, I would anticipate that there would be, but you know, I, I've heard about this new antibody treatment that will they'll take care of that. But, um, yeah, so that's where I can't say specifically uh, about that, but I, I don't think that'll be any different than what we've seen in the past in terms of of delivery. If I can ask a second question, what about stability of these vectors in the salt solutions? Um, yeah, I you know that's a, other than just retitering it, um, which we've done and haven't seen much of a drop. We haven't spent a lot of time addressing that specific question, but I, I can't say for AAV specifically that uh, it's, it's kind of it's kind of funny because when we elute when we when we purify AAV, we run it through columns. And you elute with a high salt solution, and then you dialyze that off. So this could save a step. <laughs> so we it's it's we know that with at least AAV that it should be perfectly stable uh, with with uh, with a high salt solution. Patrick uh, J. Coles, too. It may be in a related question. Um, is have you investigated just giving nebulized hypertonic saline first, and then 
prior to Vector? Or uh, is, uh, have you only done the kind of the ad mixing? We've we've done it in vitro. So we, we've played with timing in vitro to see if you could pre-treat. So we did different things where we, we pre-treated with with the uh, saline followed by the vector, or we treated with a vector and then gave it a pulse of, of a saline at the end kind of a thing. And we found that two hours of a co-treatment was basically optimal, um, but we haven't repeated those studies in vivo at all. Thank you. Hi, hi, Pat. Justin Haynes, Johns Hopkins. Uh, stunning work. Really glad I came to see that. Um, that was one of the questions I had. It seems like to me that you could do it first and then come in if not. But uh, the other one is, have you tried this yet in like your CF pig or ferrets yet? Uh, where, you know, just to see how robust it can be in animals that have uh, that kind of um, environment in the lungs? Yeah, we have not. Um, I mean, we've done it. We've done it with LPC in, in CF pigs. And, and saw really nice correction in vivo with, with all three vector types. Um, but we have not repeated it with, with HTS yet, but yeah, I, I, I would hope that the level of correction in vivo would even be higher than what we saw before. And following that, I'm Gary Cutting from Johns Hopkins. Um, I seem to recall there used to be an argument, something about high saw or low saw in the ASL. <laughs> <laughs> Right, so I think I remember one of the screening yeah, yeah, yeah. matches. Yeah, you remember one of them? Yeah. So, what, what do you think? Is there any anything uh, that could be woven into this to consider whether or not transduction rates would be different in the CF airway versus the normal airway if the salt is different in the ASL? Uh, I don't know. I, I, I would imagine that when when people would talk about high salt, they weren't talking about five percent. Um, I think that probably blow it away. Um, I, I wouldn't, I mean, it, it looks, from everything we've seen in vitro, I, I, we, that usually translates in vivo pretty well, but it is definitely something worth keeping in mind as we move forward. Wonderful. Let's thank our speaker again. So next up, we've got Justin Haynes from Johns Hopkins, uh, and he's going to talk to us about overcoming mucus barriers with nanomedicines. Okay, who am I using all this stuff? Let's see if you just click one button here. Okay. Yep. I might need my glasses up here. <laughs> <laughs> uh oh. What? Let's see if you go back. I know they uploaded it. You can look, try and look us. Huh. Can someone run next door and ask them if they can re-upload that or? Yeah. <laughs> we have someone here who can help us. Oops, we'll begin. Oops. Maybe we go to you until if we can't get it yeah. and then. If you go to try show monitor here. Oh, oh, oh sorry. sorry. Um, ooh, this is uh, here. Go to Wrong previous day, day yeah. and go to 2 p.m. Mm -hmm. right. yeah. Okay, maybe you go and then I'll see if they can fix it. Yeah, <laughs> we could do that, yeah. Okay. All right, uh, so I think we'll just um, change the program slightly uh, to, to work through these technical difficulties. So um, uh, I guess I will go next. <laughs> All right. All right, it's my pleasure to introduce. <laughs> <laughs> Alexandra Potonsky to stop, Despot. I'm so sorry. It's okay. <laughs> Uh, I know I was going to mess that up. Uh, uh, from uh, the University of Michigan. 
Awesome. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, so yeah, I'm a, a brand new assistant professor. I just opened my lab um, in February. And before that, uh, I was a postdoc at Yale. Um, and so uh, the work I'm going to show you today um, sort of all falls under this, this umbrella of uh, polymeric nanoparticle strategies to overcome barriers for systemic uh, CF gene therapy. And so some of the work I'm going to show you is uh, from sort of the, the tail end of my postdoc. Um, and then I'll also show you some of the exciting new directions that we're, um, that we're pursuing in my own lab. Uh, so first, uh, here are my disclosures. Uh, and then a little bit of an introduction, as I know this is kind of a, a broad audience. Um, so why nanoparticles? Um, so in our work, we're particularly interested in nucleic acid-based therapeutics for genetic disorders. Um, and these tend to be fragile and subject to degradation if they're not somehow protected. Um, and furthermore, uh, these kinds of therapeutics also need to be able to enter cells in order to execute their desired functions. Um, and uh, nucleic acids t typically do not uh, 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 readily cr uh, cross the plasma membrane. And so we're interested in using polymeric nanoparticles to address this delivery problem, which serve to both uh, protect the, ther the therapeutic cargo and in an ideal world uh, also promote uh, tissue and cell specific uptake. And so uh, I like to show this figure just to kind of highlight all of the barriers that are present when we think about sort of a, a systemic administration. So I know um, sort of in the first two sessions, we were talking more about um, sort of local delivery to the airways, but there's a number of reasons why we might want to administer therapeutics uh, systemically, which I'll touch on in a little bit. But um, first, just, just to kind of highlight some of these, right? So there's barriers on multiple length scales too. So there's um, barriers on the organism level, such as sort of systemic uh, clearance mechanisms, immunogenicity, toxicity, um, sort of access to target tissues via circulation. And then even if you are able to reach uh, a target organ of interest, uh, there can be a number of local barriers at the organ or tissue level. So for example, um, sort of local physical barriers or um, uh, sort of heterogeneity in local distribution patterns and uh, perhaps differences in vascular permeability and uh, ability of your nanotherapeutics to extravasate and then also access to target cell types within a tissue. Um, and then once you are lucky enough to get into your target cell, um, there's also uh, intracellular barriers at the cell level. And so sort of in the, theo in the field of um, polymer nanoparticles for nucleic acid delivery, we think a lot about sort of endosomal escape. So is the nucleic acid a cargo able to escape the polymeric vehicle and also escape the endosome, uh, as these are typically uh, taken up into the cell via endocytosis? Um, and the other reason I bring this up is that it's really important to sort of understand delivery in its intended physiological context, right? So um, sort of typical pharmaceutical pipelines um, use a variety of uh, cell culture studies, often just sort of simple two-dimensional culture cell plastics, um, which can be really useful for understanding sort of fundamental drug mechanisms, but are not useful at all, uh, typically for um, identifying delivery vehicles that are going to be effective in vivo. And so this, uh, to me, just highlights the fact that we really need to study in vivo delivery in vivo. And so um, in the context of polymer delivery vehicles, at least, if we look in the literature, um, unless uh, the target organ is the liver, um, most uh, delivery vehicles um, are administered locally uh, in order to execute a desired effect in a particular um, uh, tissue or, or organ system. Uh, however, this strategy isn't necessarily viable for diseases that affect sort of internal organ systems or um, in situ tumors or, um, or especially diseases that affect sort of multiple organ systems. And in the context of CF, uh, why would we even consider IV delivery? Um, even though sort of uh, sort of some of the the more severe manifestations of the uh, of CF disease are um, present in the lungs, fundamentally CF is a multi-organ disease, right? So um, it, it truly affects both the lungs and a number of other organ systems. Uh, for example, the GI tract. And so um, it would be really nice if we could use an intravenously administered therapeutic to reach all of these different uh, target organ systems. 
And so um, my lab uh, and part of my, my uh, time as a postdoc was sort of focused on this question of how can we modulate in vivo delivery in our case using polymeric uh, nanoparticles. So there's a number of different kinds of strategies that we've looked at for this. So um, sort of uh, popularly in the field, you know, we think about uh, altering nanoparticle characteristics such as size, surface charge, sort of underlying uh, polymer or in this case lipid chemistry. Um, we, it's also been shown that dosing can have a significant effect, for example, on the uh, circulation half-life uh, that um, nanoparticles um, uh, have in, in vivo. Uh, and uh, what I won't have too much time to talk about today, but what we're also interested in is this idea of sort of enhancing by distribution with pre-administered decoy formulations that are uh, intended to sort of um, intentionally occupy phagocytic cells that normally contribute to uh, systemic clearance. And so uh, one particular family of polymeric materials that we're interested in studying for um, the purposes of sort of really uh, digging deep into the structure function relationships that uh, dictate how these nanomedicines behave in vivo uh, is this family of polyamine coesters or, or PACEs. Um, and we really think of these materials as being tunable at multiple levels. So. Um, uh, the basic or classic polymer in this family has uh, three component monomers. So it has this lactone group that confers uh, hydrophobicity and stability. It has an amino diol group uh, that confers a mildly cationic charge, which is uh, actually what makes these materials particularly effective for delivery of negatively charged nucleic acid cargo. Um, and uh, in the classic version, there's also an ester um, that enables additional hydrophobic control um, or variations in this N group um, introduce uh, different N group chemistries that can then downstream uh, sort of provide different types of um, nanomedicine cell interactions. Um, and there are several reasons why these polymers in particular are promising for nucleic acid delivery. So they're biocompatible, biodegradable, um, due to the incorporation of these amine-containing monomers. Um, they're very mildly cationic since they're, um, they don't make up the entire polymer chain, which serves to both, again, encapsulate negatively charged uh, cargo pretty efficiently, but then also sort of mitigate any excess positive charge. Um, so it's been shown in the field that other sort of heavily cationic polymers like polyethylenamine or PEI, which some of you may be familiar with, um, uh, can have a significantly toxic effect. Uh, these materials are also um, highly versatile in that we can sort of control the, the polymer chain um, and the sort of physical properties of the, of the polymer by modifying the um, chemical content of the monomers, right? So we can produce sort of liquid materials as well as solid materials. And then beyond that, we can also use various formulation techniques um, to uh, produce very different kinds of uh, nanoparticles with different characteristics. And so uh, we can synthesize really quite a large library of these materials and we can formulate them into vehicles um, that have been shown to be effective for the delivery of um, a number of different kinds of nucleic acids, such as plasma DNA, mRNA, siRNA, um, both in cell culture, but also uh, in vivo. And so um, really the direction that my lab is now taking is um, really trying to understand uh, how, how best to study these materials in vivo and how can we sort of carefully characterize and catalog their behavior uh, ultimately to be able to um, sort of rationally design delivery vehicles for future applications. So um, in a recent report, we developed this sort of high throughput evaluation tool uh, to standardize and accelerate the analysis of circulation half-life of intravenously injected therapeutics. So this can be anything that's fluorescently labeled. Uh, of course, we like to use this system for um, diluted polymeric nanoparticles, for example. Um, and essentially, you can in inject these intravenously, and then over time, you collect very small blood volumes, only two microliters. Um, and then you can dispense them into a multi-well glass bottom plate along with a set of standards with a known concentration of your therapeutic agent. Um, and then uh, we can uh, sort of automatically image this entire plate uh, and then use the custom MATLAB code that we've developed in-house uh, to relate fluorescence intensity to nanoparticle concentration. 
Um, and so essentially, uh, we can then back out these nice sort of uh, blood concentration curves. Uh, and since we're only collecting such a small blood volume, it actually equates to less than 1% of the blood volume of a mouse. Uh, we really want to be able to maximize the uh, potential data that we can get from a single experiment. And so we can also couple this uh, high throughput system with other measures of biodistribution, such as flow cytometry or whole organ imaging using an IVIS system, for example. Um, and then, uh, you know, even within flow cytometry, we can look at different cell types. And again, um, we're really hoping to sort of uh, build a very sort of comprehensive database of how these materials behave in um, in vivo when they're delivered systemically. Uh, so in some of our preliminary studies, we've already seen that uh, polymer chemistry and nanoparticle characteristics such as size uh, play a very significant role in tissue tropism. Uh, so here I'm showing two of our um, sort of favorite paste polymers, if you will. Um, one incorporating this uh, polyethylene glycol or PEG as a block copolymer um, and using sort of uh, different formulation strategies, we're able to generate two different sizes of the same um, uh, sort of nanoparticle form with, a, with the same polymer essentially. Um, and in this case, uh, just by looking at sort of IVIS imaging of uh, biodistribution, uh, we can see that even small modifications in nanoparticle size can result in pretty stark differences in biodistribution, right? And so we've been expanding on this data set um, and really starting to, uh, to study sort of our, our, the full breadth of our, our polymer and vehicle library. So again, here I'm showing a slightly larger subset and just sort of illustrating the kind of data that we're able to collect. So um, concentration in the blood using that high throughput protocol I described, IVIS imaging to look sort of broadly um, at, at distribution sort of um, in, in a wide range of major organs. Um, and then we can also use flow cytometry, which I'm not showing here, but this is just the quantification of the IVIS. Um, and here, uh, one thing that's starting to become um, uh, apparent is that sort of increased time in circulation uh, results in increased opportunities to interact with extra hepatic tissues, as we can see here with these pace peg formulations, for example, in purple. And so um, we've started to, to really try to um, uh, put these data together into a database and uh, and really try to understand sort of what are the effects of polymer chemistry and size and also the time and circulation and sort of predicting how these vehicles are going to behave and sort of how um, widespread their distribution can be. Um, and there's a lot there's a lot of more uh, to explore here, but here's just a subset where we're looking at um, sort of the relationship between uh, cumulative uh, extra hepatic. Uh, uh, percentage of nanoparticle positive cells versus time and circulation, or also um, the cumulative number of um, extra hepatic organs that are positive for nanoparticles. Um, so again, we can see this uh, slight trend that again, um, uh, time and circulation is a, is a good indicator of uh, ability to reach um, sort of multiple organ systems. So what about dose? Uh, it turns out this is also important, um, as others have shown. So uh, interestingly, we found that increasing the dose of the same nanoparticle type actually increases its half-life. So the same sort of pace peg formulation that I showed you previously, um, at the, the dose that I showed you previously, the half-life is about 24 hours. But if we increase the dose pretty significantly, we can get a half-life of about 80 hours. Um, and moreover, what we found is that there seems to be a threshold dose beyond which you start to see significant accumulation in extra hepatic tissues, uh, as illustrated in these uh, plots of uh, flow cytometry data. So our hypothesis here is that the filtration rate by macrophages, or in this flow plot indicated by this F480 marker, um, uh, have, a, have, a, have a limited filtration rate. And so, uh, potentially complete or almost complete macrophage occupation then allows for significant accumulation in other tissues and cell types. And we're sort of continuing to explore this. Um, and with the data sets we've generated, we're also really interested in seeing if we can model the behavior of uh, polymeric nanoparticles uh, computationally, and then also ideally use these data um, in order to ultimately help us in optimizing rational nanoparticle designs for particular applications. 
And so um, we're starting to do this uh, with our sort of existing set of biodistribution data. So we have a uh, sort of a pharmacokinetic model as shown here, where each organ system that we've looked at can be modeled as its own compartment. And then within each organ, uh, there are also subcompartments. So for example, the intravascular space, um, extravascular space, uh, phagoc phagocytes uh, in certain organs, um, and so forth. And so we can create sort of these uh, model equations uh, to describe each uh, sort of the flow of nanoparticles into and out of each of these different compartments. Um, and so how does our how does our model do? So um, in that data set that I just showed you of sort of different doses of pace peg nanoparticles, um, we're able to pretty well uh, recapitulate that with the model. So the this first uh, panel here is just experimental data with um, uh, just fitting an exponential de decay curve. This is actually the model prediction with the experimental data overlaid. Um, and then I'm also showing you sort of the predicted nanoparticle concentration in each of these different organ systems over time. Um, and the model is able to pretty well predict the organs that we see sort of significant accumulation in over time. And also this idea that um, only at these higher doses where sort of the, the macrophages are, are occupied, um, do you see sort of, do you start to see significant uh, accumulation, right? So there's a pretty big separation between these higher doses and these uh, lower doses here. So we're really excited to see where this goes and uh, continuing to gather data using uh, new nanoparticle types to, to train this model and hopefully um, to one day be able to help us predict um, what, what will be most effective for um, particular tissues and diseases. Um, and then sort of another thing, another area that we're really sort of interested in is um, sort of this, this idea of diversity and delivery outcomes, right? So just as patients have different responses to therapeutics, so for example, CF patients with the same sort of genomic background, um, uh, can have varying responses to trikafta, for example, and why is that? What What is driving that? Um, and so likewise, we're interested in how different factors such as age and sex, disease state, um, and even sort of species differences can affect delivery. Um, and also uh, in understanding how our sort of typical model systems or how predictive our typical model systems are of what might be potential outcomes in sort of more clinically relevant larger animal model species and ultimately human right? So I'll show you kind of two instances where, where we are starting to see differences, right? So the data I showed you earlier was all uh, done in wild type mice. Uh, so these are bulb sea animals, uh, although we've seen sort of similar um, results in uh, just wild type C57 black six mice. Um, but uh, we also did this exact same comp uh, experiment comparing just two different pace formulations in this case um, in uh, CF mice that are homozygous for the F5O8-DEL mutation. And already here, uh, we're, we're seeing sort of differences in biodistribution, right? So the general trend is there. So the pegylated nanoparticles have more widespread distribution. But in the CF animals, we do see significant accumulation in the lung, even with this sort of larger formulation that typically is only sequestered to the liver and the spleen. So we're already starting to see um, sort of influences of, of sort of disease state, right? And so we're... we're uh, now doing the work of taking a closer look at this, understanding what are the cell types that we're accumulating in. My suspicion is um, sort of uh, macrophages, um, but we'll, we'll see. Um, and then in terms of sort of uh, species differences, so we've done some work um, through our participation in the Somatic Cell Genome Editing Consortium run by the NIH. Um, we've been fortunate enough to collaborate with uh, Alice Tarantall and her team at UC Davis to do some non-human primate experiments. Um, so again, here we're looking at our sort of pegylated PACE formulation that performs uh, well in mice and that uh, we see sort of widespread distribution. Thankfully, we do see the same effect here um, in non-human primates. And we also see sort of uh, similar uh, sort of EGFP mRNA delivery um, so compared to our dilated formulation. So our uh, sort of delivery using dyes is pretty correlative of um, 
what tissues will actually express a therapeutic cargo, right? So transfection, fashion, transfection efficiency correlates well with delivery. Um, but if we really take a closer look and compare sort of mouse versus NHP, uh, we do see some differences. So right, again, widespread distribution overall, which is great, but you'll see that in mice, we see primary accumulation in the liver, whereas in NHPs, uh, it's in the kidney. And so, um, you know, there's a lot of sort of physiological differences that we really need to pay attention to. Um, and we're just starting to, to elucidate these. All right, so just to, to wrap up, hopefully I've shown you that um, in vivo delivery to target tissues is a key barrier uh, for the clinical translation of therapeutics, um, particularly uh, in our case with non-viral carriers. Um, Hopefully, uh, our tunable polymeric platforms can be used to design smarter vehicles for in vivo delivery once we continue to learn a little bit more about how they interact uh, with their intended sort of biological environments. Um, that these sort of high throughput tools uh, that uh, are based in quantitative microscopy can really help us uh, in answering this question of what the structure function relationships are uh, that guide nanoparticle physiological fate. And then lastly, that these sort of age, sex, disease, state, species considerations are really important for drug delivery and something worth uh, paying attention to. Um, and with that, I'll end with some acknowledgements. So as I mentioned, um, we're a relatively new lab, uh, but I've got three graduate students and a fabulous undergrad so far. Uh, we're starting to build our team and um, really excited to, to answer some of these questions. Of course, I wanna acknowledge my primarily uh, postdoc mentor, Mark Saltzman, um, and a lot of the, the CF experiments were done with my, my other uh, mentor, Marie Egan, um, and then of course, uh, uh, Alice Tarantal and her team at UC Davis um, um, helped us out a lot with uh, the primate experience, uh, experiments and um, we're incredibly grateful for uh, funding from a number of sources and notably the NIH and the foundation. So with that, thank you so much. All right, questions? A great talk. So you were suggesting that the um, that you kind of have to saturate the macrophage reservoir. Um, so have you looked at administering clodronate like experimentally, and then does that shift the distribution? Absolutely, yeah. So um, so I was, I was debating on whether or not to include that data, but yeah, we're exploring a number of different uh, what we like to call decoy molecules. So we've tried clodronate liposomes, we've tried intralipid, we've even tried sort of blank polymeric nanoparticles, um, and all of them seem to have an effect. Clodronate has sort of the most pronounced effect because that essentially depletes the macrophages for at least a certain period of time. And absolutely, I, we, we find that we can significantly enhance the distribution of a nanoparticle that normally only goes to liver and spleen if we pre-treat with something like that 24 hours ahead of time. So yeah. And in, in vitro, like, uh, do you know um, uh, the, are there obstinates in serum that that facilitate uptake, or 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 you think it's uh, completely non-obsonic through maybe like cavialin one or some other? Um, oh, so you mean the, sort of like once you get to your target cells, how they're taken I, up? Essentially. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and is there a role for other serum proteins that? potentially serve as obstinance in terms of the macrophage uptake? Uh, yeah, so in the in the nanomedicine field, um, uh, there's this idea of a sort of protein corona that that forms around uh, nanoparticles when they're administered systemically. And absolutely, I'm, I'm sure that has an effect. Um, we haven't looked at that specifically, at least in the context of our PACE nanoparticles, but I absolutely believe that that is a key uh, driver also of tissue tropism, yeah. Ashley Cooney, the University of Iowa. That was a really fascinating talk. Have you, do any of your computational approaches take into account to detarget the liver or kidney or try to enhance lung um, delivery? Yeah, so kind of along the lines of uh, what we were just talking about, we're, we're trying to sort of model this sort of maximizing this phagocytic capacity and seeing if that sort of can boost uh, accumulation or simulated accumulation in other organs. And so far it seems to be the case. Uh, great talk. Uh, this is May from University of Texas at Austin. I'm kind of wondering when you saturate these macrophages, could this possibly have an effect on the immune response for other um, organisms or pathogens? 
Yeah, absolutely. And that's something that we need to pay very uh, close attention to. So in our um, sort of pre preliminary studies on sort of um, uh, looking at cytokines in the serum and also uh, looking at sort of liver enzymes, we don't see any sort of detrimental effects, but that's something that we are obviously always paying attention to and we'll need to explore further. Are, are you able to model like the route of administration, like a, a hepatic vein or a, a pulmonary artery or is that yeah, that's a great question. So right now we're just uh, modeling just uh, administration sort of intravenously. So um, not so much sort of where that is in the body, um, but that would be interesting, right? Um, it, it, in some of our studies, we haven't seen a difference when we administer, um, for example, retroorbally versus in the tail vein, at least in the mouse model. Um, but yeah, I, I agree. That's an important parameter to consider. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Hopefully it'll... We have to close this down now, right? Oh, okay, okay. Speaker is. I don't know how to do it. It's just the All right, bear with us. Can you plug this in over there? Oh, plug this in where? Just the first one. I'll drag all of them in case okay. some of the other ones don't work. Look at the top there. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Good luck. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks for our handiwork <laughs> here. Um, so thanks uh, to Alex and Pat for inviting me. Uh, very excited to be here. Uh, two great talks, three great talks that I've just heard already makes it well worth it. And also I have uh, my mother, father and sister and her family are all in this neighborhood. So great to be here. Um, and I liked, uh, I think the first talk, uh, Jay said that he got his first funding um, in the area of CF gene therapy. And the same thing was true for me. My first R01, uh, maybe not my first funding, but my first R01 was, uh, you know, about a decade and a half or more ago. And it was in the area of CF gene therapy. And, uh, we proposed what I'm going to tell you about today. And during that R01, we never achieved it, but we figured it out later. So um, let's see, did I skip here? Okay, so uh, I have some financial disclosures listed here. Um, the main company that has developed, uh, that I started to develop the mucus penetrating particles I'm going to tell you about is the top one, uh, Cala Pharmaceuticals, although they're using it primarily for eye drops, which kind of driving me crazy right now. Um, <laughs> but uh, all my conflicts are managed by Johns Hopkins University. Um, so I like to show this just to start off. And, and um, what I'm showing here is, is uh, what we want on the left is uh, this, I think, is just a trachea of an animal. And the, the particles here are labeled red and we want them to spread evenly go through all the mucus barriers and get into the cells and transfect the cells evenly but what we too often see when we're doing our research with viruses and non-viral systems is very spotty um you know uh places where the particles are being balled up usually kept away from the epithelium as i'll show you and not giving us good transfection and so um, one of the major points that I'm going to make today is that often has to do with the mucus barrier that, that in CF is extremely pronounced. So to give you an idea, uh, water has a viscosity of about one centipoise. Okay. Um, glycerol is a very viscous thing. It's about, uh, uh, I believe 2000 centipoise. Uh, normal human mucus is somewhere around that at low shear rates. Um, CF sputum can be a hundred thousand or a million, okay, uh, times that of water. So it's almost the same viscosity as stiff rubber uh, when you're talking about mucus that people expectorate. And uh, if you look at it though, it's not uniformly like this solid stiff thing, it's a mesh. Okay, so it, it has these solid strands in it, but it also has these openings. And so we started thinking about that, if we're ever gonna get gene therapies to go through and get to the underlying cells, what would we need to do? They'd have to be smaller than this mesh. They'd have to then also not stick to the mesh as they're going through it. Turns out mucus is very sticky. Uh, 
So um, we we have done some studies tracking how various viral vectors, and actually we have AAV5, I, I wasn't sure how, if we had that one in here, how they transport through human CF sputum and uh, the rates at which they go. And uh, this is a little bit complicated, but um, we're looking at uh, MSD is a mean square displacement, so how, roughly how fast is the particle moving and uh, the percentage of the gene vectors moving at that rate. And you'll see that the viruses, AV1, 2, 5, and then a clinical system that was tested, you know, kind of early on relatively, a non-viral system um, with support from CF Foundation, they all move, you know, quite slowly with maybe a few outliers moving a little faster. Um, and some of the systems I'm going to tell you about today all move on, on average, you know, a couple of order of magnitudes faster. So our work in, in trying to figure out how to make systems that go through mucus is largely motivated by this paper. In fact, it was uh, Alex's postdoc mentor, Mark Saltzman, collaborating with one of my close collaborators, uh, Richard Cohn, uh, in a paper way back in 2001, um, where they showed that most proteins go through mucus like they go through water. And uh, most viruses don't, like the herpes simplex virus, you can see going, you know, very slowly. But there was a couple of viruses that they could identify, Noroc virus and human papillomavirus, that go through mucus like they go through water. This was very inspiring, right? Um, so Noroc virus, if you're not familiar with it, it's, have you ever heard of like people are on a cruise ship and one person comes down with a GI infection and then the whole ship is sick? Well, it's an incredibly infectious virus. And uh, same thing for HPV. Unlike herpes simplex virus, which is transmitted very actually infrequently, not to encourage people to have risky sex or anything, but very infrequently from a person who's infected to a person who's not, HPV, on the other hand, is almost one-to-one. -one. If you have sex with somebody who's infected with HPV, you are almost certain to become infected with HPV. And it's because, largely we think because, and other viruses like HIV viruses, one we've done research on, it goes through quite slowly unless, um, unless the female partner has a condition called bacterial vaginosis, which compromises the, the mucus, uh, then it goes right through, and those women are much more susceptible to infection. So uh, again, um, just focusing on this. So what is it about this Norwalk and HPV? Um, they are capsid viruses. That are, e that are coded equally with positive and negative charges. And every time there's a positive charge, within five angstroms, there's a negative charge to offset it. So what does that do? It gives you a very hydrophilic and net neutral surface, which basically stops you from sticking, allows you to go through because of that. So we started thinking, well, what else could we do um, that would uh, give our particle surfaces, you know, this properties of hydrophilic and net neutrally charged. And an obvious thing for us was polyethylene glycol or PEG. And uh, so we started looking to see if people had done that. And in fact, literature, my, my graduate student brought me, I, I like to say it was like almost a, as high as my eyes of papers that all said that PEG was something you put on delivery systems to make them stick more to mucus. And uh, so I was feeling kind of dumb because I was a young professor at that time, and here's this very promising um, graduate student um, telling me this idea is probably not going to work. Um, so we started looking at it, and something that we found was um, the seminal work was really done by Nick Peps's lab. We found that he said that PEG probably is adhesive because these long PEG chains can interpenetrate into that mucus mesh and get tangled up, kind of like Christmas lights. You shove them into a box. When you try to pull them out, you can't separate them anymore because they're all tangled. So that gave us the idea, well, uh, and then we looked, okay, we'll look through all these papers. What's the lowest molecular weight peg anybody had ever reported as mucoadhesive? And to our surprise, it was about 10,000 Daltons. Well, our field doesn't even use 10,000 Daltons usually. Usually use two or 5,000 Daltons. And uh, so I said, okay, well, uh, maybe if the peg's too short, it won't be able to make these entanglements and we'll be able to get it on the surfaces. And, and if it's you know, long enough, but not too short, maybe we can coat our particle surfaces. So we started trying intermediate molecular weight pegs. So we asked this question, what about low molecular weight peg? And I have to skip through a lot of work here and just show this video. I'm not sure I'm gonna make this work, but suffice it to say, uh, it's not showing up like this is working, darn it. So um, what, you, what you would see if this video was working 
It was um, the particles on the left that are uncoated, even though they're much smaller than the mucus mesh, are completely trapped in undiluted human mucus. But the particles on the right are just going in and out of the mucus as fast as they could move like they're moving through water. And this happens in all different types of mucus that we've gotten from both animals and humans on, uh, in fresh, undiluted types of mucus that we've tested this in. So um, we've tested this in a lot of different things, but I'm focused on the lung today. So I wanted to show you, if, if we co-administer particles that have these very dense, low molecular weight peg coatings, uh, with particles that don't have the peg coatings or have lower levels of peg coatings, you see things like this. Here's a function of size. If I focus on this 100 nanometer, you can see my, uh oh, you can't see that, what I'm doing here. So uh, how do I show, a, show this? This? Laser pointer. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so <laughs> thank you. So uh, this is 100 nanometer particles. The ones that are, have the dense, low molecular weight peg coatings are red. You can see they're getting very close, right? In, in fact, we know up into the epithelium of these cells. This is in, uh, I believe, a mouse airway. Um, Co-administered green particles that are, don't have the coatings show up here as yellow because they're co-localized with some of the red. And you might say, well, you, you administered a lot more of the red. No, we administered exactly equal amounts. The green ones are cleared very rapidly because they're in the outer layers of the mucus layers that are rapidly cleared from the airways, and the red ones are getting deep into the mucus layers and into the cell layers. 200 still seem to penetrate fairly well. You can barely see any of the 200 unpegulated now, but you see some. 1,000 nanometers, it doesn't matter if you have peg coatings or not. It's way too large. They, they can't get through the mesh of the, of the mucus. These are normal airways of mice, okay? Uh, what was interesting is you don't often see submucosal glands in rodents, but when you do, our particles are lining them instantly. This is within minutes after uh, administration by, I think, intranasal administration of these mice. And here's a submucosal gland, and you see the, the, just the, the mucus penetrating nanoparticles are coating that submucosal gland. Here's the, uh, from the trachea to the two bronchi, so you can see how uniform it is kind of everywhere. This is another submucosal gland um, where you see that. Um, it's not just airways. I'm not going to spend a lot of time, but uh, this is in the mouse vagina. Um, there's deep folds, like you can see in a human here. Um, and the, the conventional particles are all stuck in the middle in this mucus gel that fills the lumen. But uh, the mucus penetrating particles can go right through the mucus and go right to the epithelium in the vagina. Same thing in the GI tract. Not going to spend a lot of time on this, but um, it looks like even particles are potentially accessing crypts if they're small enough. Um, so we, we started thinking about ways that we could make very small gene carriers, because in our work, we found um, in vivo to get high transfection, you need to have a very small particle. And for the longest time, we couldn't make a small particle with dense enough peg to avoid adhe adhering to mucus. And so um, one, a, a very smart graduate student of mine came up with an idea that we could mix um, s some of the heavily pegylated polymers with uh, some unpegylated polymers. And when you did this, the unpegylated uh, polymers could condense the DNA into a very small particle. And then some of the pegylated polymer would then basically primarily go to the surface of the particle and coat the surface. And when we did this, we got very dense peg coatings on gene carriers and we call it a blend method. It's very simple, um, and it works. And so, again, the video's not gonna work. Some of these videos are cool, but um, same kind of thing. This is the first time we saw a gene carrier that could go right through expectorated CF sputum um, of, of any type, um, that it went through it like it was going through water. Um, these particles, I mean, I'm not gonna spend much time on this. They can transfect, uh, you know, differentiated primary airway uh, epithelial cells is some work we did with Bill Gugino, Ludmilla, Sabataru. Um, if you inhale them into mice, these mice don't have really bad mucus, uh, unfortunately, but um, you see pretty robust gene expression. Um, these are the pegylated ones. In fact, um, Alex mentioned PEI can be toxic in and of itself. At higher doses, it can be toxic, but when it's heavily pegylated like this, we don't see 
I'm, I think I'm going to show, no, not the PEI, but, oh, yeah, I have a PEI. Oh, no, so I'm not showing the PEI. But when we have heavy pegylated, it looks like water, basically, in the lung airways. Um, so you can get orders of magnitude better gene expression. This was actually the Copernicus system, which, which looked really good in mice. Uh, we're well over an order of magnitude higher than that system um, was. Um, this is just looking, we've made biodegradable systems since then, um, looking at the safety of these things. And, and the, any time you have the heavily pegylated system, the particles look, look essentially like a, administering saline. Um, this is just looking at gene transfer with one of the biodegradable systems that we've been working on. Wanted to let you know that we're doing that as well. And you get quite uh, robust gene expression with these as well. Um, I wanted to show something else to see, that you know, that these systems can translate from, from, you know, from side to side. They're, they're, no, they don't, they're really kind of agnostic. They probably are going through a, more like a caviolin type uh, uptake pathway. We make them very small. I didn't say how small. They're like 50 to 60 nanometers or so. And uh, so I wanted to show um, if we administer them just locally into the brain, um, either the conventionally pegylated, so as light peg, in the showing up yellow here, or the heavily pegylated, uh, what we call brain penetrating nanoparticles in this case, you see that they distribute much more widely from a local infusion if they have the dense peg. And this is due to the extracellular matrix in the brain is actually quite sticky as well. And, and in fact, we were surprised in, in a paper that, uh, that we did suggested that it might even be stickier somehow. Um, that was looking at where the particles go. This is looking at transfection in the brain. This is a single infusion in a rat brain of two microliters of our gene carrier. And you can see this is two dimensions, um, no peg, some peg, you get a little bit better distribution, dense peg, you get a lot of distribution. And this is a 3D rendering of that. And you can basically see from a sm single infusion, you're transfecting a, a high percentage of these cells throughout the entire striatum of the rat. Um, we've also been focused, uh, doing this, some work with Rich Price for many years now at, at uh, UVA. And I'm not going to go into the story, but uh, long story short is you can use focus ultrasound uh, with microbubbles. So you infuse these contrast agent microbubbles into the blood. And then you use focus ultrasound, which is basically a, a pressure wave. Right. And uh, that pressure in wherever you want to get, you know, transient disruption of the vasculature, you can you can focus this. So with submillimeter resolution, you can choose where you want to disrupt vasculature throughout the body and even in the brain safely. And uh, these, this is the first study that I think showed any ability to put a gene carrier into the blood at a very small amount and then use focus ultrasound to get it to go into the brain and then transfect that tissue. And uh, we did a dose escalation because we had no idea what we were going to find. And even at our lowest dose of DNA, we saw clear evidence of transfection. And then it got better and better as we went up in dose, obviously. Uh, we published a lot of papers on this since, so I just wanted to give you a taste of that. Um, in looking at the number of people who contributed to this work, I think it's, uh, it's in the many hundreds now. So I can't thank everybody. Uh, this is a partial list. I've tried to bring up some of the folks uh, along the way. Um, so really grateful to uh, all of the people who have helped, our collaborators, uh, students, fellows, and uh, obviously for funding from places like the NIH and Cystic Fibrosis Foundation. Thanks so much. Open up for questions. Hi, Ron Rubenstein, Wash U in St. Louis. Um, what I think you said these were five hundred nanometer particles. No, no, the, no. The gene carriers that we're working on are usually about fifty to sixty nanometers. Okay, so what? Can you get them up to the sort of respirable size that sits in the lo lower airway of a couple microns? And what happens with that? Um, I don't, wouldn't want to do that. I would want to administer them in a, in a drop, like a nebulizer, and that, let, well, let the drop size. Well, yeah, so, yeah. That, yeah, but the particle, the respiral. No, the, 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 the size of the water droplet okay. will determine where it goes in the airways. Okay. Right, so you just make a one, a one micron water droplet and you'll get transfection okay. everywhere. And, and is the driving force for these to spread just diffusion forces, concentration, gradients? 
Um, you can. Uh, it's primarily, I think, diffusion, but we can manipulate that in some organs by putting them in a hypotonic solution. It could be even just mildly hypotonic, like 200, 250 milliosmolar, and that will drive water uptake, and that drives the particles towards the epithelium. Hi, I'm John Lewick, University of Rochester. Uh, you didn't speak to the size of the DNA and the topology of the DNA, and is it double-stranded, is it single-stranded, and does it affect what you're trying to accomplish here? Yeah, in all the stuff I've shown here, it's double-stranded DNA. The plasmid itself is over, typically over a micron. We've done up well over 20 uh, kilobase pairs, and that doesn't matter. You can always shrink them down um, to very small sizes. Uh, so it's kind of like, I call it sometimes shrink wrapping because it's just a charge-charge interaction that, that makes these things shrink. Um, so double-stranded DNA in this case. Uh, um, what else did, did I miss something? Just topology of the DNA. Is it all circular? Is it linear? Oh, yeah, this is all circular I got plasmids. It, yeah. yeah, thanks. Hey, excellent, uh, inspiring work. Uh, I'm Ross Wilson from UC Berkeley. I'm curious about the interplay between, you know, pegylation uh, promoting tissue distribution, but then also, you know, do you potentially pay a price at the membrane crossing step? Yeah, so for the longest time, that's what we thought would happen too, and the whole field thought it forever. And uh, when we started making these things, um, we saw transfection efficiency in vitro and cell culture went down. Transfection efficiency in vivo went way through the roof. And so what we found since then is when you make them heavily pegylated, but extreme, only when they get extremely small, they can go right into cells by other pathways that, uh, you know, the cells are kind of constantly uh, sampling their environment through very small vesicles like cavioli and, and other things. And so we get, uh, for example, in the brain, it's, it's almost equal. Um, uh, I think it's astrocytes and neurons you know, they, they just basically all take it up. And in the airways, it seems that way too. Whatever they hit, they seem to transfect pretty well. Thanks. Hi, Justin, Stephen Rowe. Hey, um, Steve. Good to see you. Um, really compelling talk, Th thanks so much. What, 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 one of the questions I have is uh, regarding uh, the ability to transit so well all the way across the epithelium, including down to the surface of the glands. Of course, this is particularly compelling to us because of our, our interest in the glands. And I'm wondering, seeing other particles that, that penetrate well but don't do that, uh, if it is simply related to their great diffusibility, which you focused on in your presentation, or is there also some aspect of attraction to the epithelial surface that might be happening? And if you've ever uh, 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 looked at that in, in particular? Um, no, I don't. I haven't looked at it. I don't think that there's like inherent attract, like the particles. Uh, I'd like to understand what you mean more about that because uh, I can't think of how they would be inherently attracted to the surface. Let me, let me add one more element is is because the glands are generally secretory, you're going, kind of going against yeah. the wave of flow. Yeah. And uh, if there was a, either a bioelectric property or a chemical property yeah. that allowed the, the epithelium to to, to bind them or attract them, that could explain it. So it, I'm kind of spitballing here. I, no, I, I, I love it. it. I, and and uh, I'd like to spitball more with you. I just really <laughs> don't have a good answer, I, you know, at this point. But I think it's worth really trying to figure out. Yeah. yeah. I also have a question. Uh, this is something that I sort of struggle with myself because uh, we also find that sort of pegylated nanoparticles tend to perform the best, especially in vivo. Um, what are your thoughts on sort of anti-peg antibodies and how could we potentially sort of overcome that barrier? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, what we found is even in people who have high level anti-peg antibodies, the, the antibody levels in their airways are not nearly enough to prevent our particles from, from penetrating. Um, so the, the anti-peg antibodies in the airways are low. Uh, relatively, and uh, so it's we haven't seen any problems there. But it's a, it's an important thing when you're thinking about uh, systemic administration. Yeah. Along those lines, are there alternatives to PEG for down the road when we all have PEG <laughs> antibodies? <laughs> yeah, uh, that is. <laughs> I'm surprised we don't all have them already. They're in it, peg is in everything. I mean, shampoos, toothpaste. I mean, you name it, it's everywhere, right? Um, so yeah, uh, 
a lot of people are working on alternatives. I think there are promising things. We haven't done so much work with them because, you know, for various reasons we've been focused, but I would like to do some more work with some of those uh, for sure. But um, it's just a matter of making time <laughs> and figuring out how to have more time. Let's yeah, thank, thank you. our speaker. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you.